good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A little bit of sprinkle this morning, by the way. I know. That's not bad. There's no lightning like there was last night. I think that scared a few people at the farmer's market when that cracked open. Well, this morning we've just got some few, a few announcements before we get started. Uh, first up, we do have um, our Is Genesis History uh, Bible study. We are officially, as of last Wednesday, halfway through. Today, uh, Mark will be starting us on the second half of the series, so uh, pay attention. There's a lot of good information in here. Um, I, I just am amazed at how often when I'm doing my morning devotionals, even on Sundays, because you know you're going through it all week long. There's but Sunday morning, as soon as you get to it, it's like the very first thing is it's like all about forgiveness. Um, so looking forward to that this morning. Um, also coming up, we have Orange Track Racing coming up on September uh, 10th. Uh, be the September races. So we have three races left of season 17. We'll start at 9.30 with registration, and depending on when people kind of flow in, because sometimes it overflows, we may start a few minutes late, but um, we do start racing at 10 o'clock, and then a week following that, on the 17th, we'll be showing the movie Tulsa, a free movie, free concessions, um, just show up is all you have to do, and we'll be posting some things on Facebook, so if you want to help us fill the, the theater, so to speak, <laughs> Um, please uh, share uh, those posts with family and friends on your on <coughs> Facebook, so would appreciate that. So this morning, uh, for our call to worship, Pastor Mark has chosen Romans 5, chapter, or Romans chapter 5, verse 18. It says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone because one person disobeyed God many became sinners but because one other person obeyed God many will be made righteous and um, the in my study this morning the opening devotion was about a prison warden and they called her governor and her thought process was, if you treat people with respect and you treat them with love, then there is forgiveness. Even though they sin, they can be redeemed. And that's what our call to worship this morning tells us, that even though Adam sinned and, brought, and Adam and he brought sin into the world, Christ came and he redeemed us and there was redemption for all of us. And so just keep that in mind as uh, we listen to Mark this morning as he brings the message that regardless of what happened in the beginning, regardless of the fact that uh, Adam and Eve sinned, and I'm, I haven't gotten a chance to look at Mark's sermon yet, so if I say something that has anything to do with your sermon, I apologize, but um, everybody likes to blame Eve for the fall because she's someone that took the fruit from the serpent. Um, Adam was standing right next to her, kept his mouth shut, so he's complicit. He's just as much to blame. And then he took from her and ate as well. So um, it, it's not just one person. We can't just blame mm -hmm. Eve for that. Mm -hmm. But thank God that he sent his son, that we would all be redeemed. Father, as we prepare to hear your message this morning, as we uh, hear this story uh, of, and it's a true story, and, and we, we have to remember that, Father. This is a true story. This is a story of history. This is what you have brought in us. That's all what all, this entire series is about, is Genesis history. It's about the fact that the scriptures tell your story of your creation from beginning to end. It's the only time that we ever find out the end of a story beforehand. But in the end, Father, we win because of what you did for us by your Son on the cross. Father, open our ears to hear. Open our hearts to, to listen and open our minds to understand the message that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Awesome, awesome. Everybody awake? You are now, right? <laughs> well, this is kind of a cool topic that we have today because, you know, 
how many times have you read the Bible or, or went through Sunday school as a kid and we hear about Adam and Eve and, you know, this nasty snake that, you know, did all these horrible things for us and now, now we're all living in sin and we're condemned. Now, as a kid, that's kind of a tough message to hear. And uh, if we don't understand the rest of the story, then we don't understand what God has done to bring us back into that right relationship with him after the fall. So Adam and Eve and the fall is what the uh, uh, message is for today. Back that out a little bit. Um, and so we had the fall. What happened? What happened? Adam and Eve, that first sin, the doctrine of the fall is the message today. Well, in my sermon a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the doctrine of creation, where God created everything, and we learned about how the nature of God was, and, and who kind of God was by how he created, what he created, and what he did for man. We learned how God created everything, and there was a timeline to how it all happened, and God created paradise, a perfect place for his perfect creation. See, he created this perfect place for man to dwell. And it was good. God said, hey, it was good. After everything that he created, God looked at it and he said, it was good. And so when we take a look at this, we, we have to understand that God placed man in this really cool place, a paradise. But more than that, that God made it good for man to be inside of there. So at that point in time, we kind of had a little inkling of what good was like. So we had a perfect place for his perfect creation. Now we need to understand at this time, there was no sin. There was no death. No pain. No sickness. There was nothing to fear. Man was made in God's image and as some theologians like to point out throughout time, that that means that God is eternal, so God made man eternal at that time. Well, if there's no death and no sin and no pain and no fear, none of the negative things in life were there. So he was made eternal, immortal. We can live forever. Genesis 2 tells us that God had given man stewardship and responsibility to tend his creation and to rule over his creation. And everything was flourishing. Life was abundant. Something we can only dream about. A paradise found. So what I'd like you to do this morning is, is just close your eyes and take a minute to imagine what that might have been like. Paradise. No pain. No suffering. No death. No sin. Life in abundance and everything was flourishing. Close your eyes and think of it. So what picture comes to mind? It's beautiful, right? When we think about it, it'd be a place that you would never want to leave. A place created just for you and your family. So this begs the question, what happened? What happened? What happened? So how long were Adam and Eve in that garden before the fall? How long did they get to, to take on that paradise and live in that paradise before the fall? Well, as I was preparing for my message, I came across the, this very question, and there's numbers of, obviously, theories out there. They're just never ending. The truth is that no one knows. And Satan, you have to figure, wouldn't waste any time whatsoever trying to upset that perfect creation that God created. And that being said, it's not spelled out clearly in the Bible. There's lots of theories, but as we know, the theories of man are not always the truth. See, only God knows. 
So I'm going to offer you one good scholarly point of view here. However, Adam and Eve, however long that they have been in the garden, one thing is for certain. They were not there for any period of time that exceeded Adam's lifespan. Now, the Bible does tell us he had a lifespan of 930 years. Okay? But there is additional information that must be considered as well. And in Genesis 4.25, it explains that Seth was born after Cain slew Abel. And since the biblical account makes it clear that Seth was born outside of the garden, they had already been cast out. And since Genesis 5.3 informs us that Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born, it's obvious that Adam and Eve couldn't have been in the garden any longer than 130 years. So we're back to that elephant in the room. Okay? What happened? What happened? So we have the fall. And people call it the fall, and... You know, it's it's a fall from grace. It's a fall from God's presence. It's a it's a it's how we sin that original sin. And in our, in our um, call to worship this morning, it talks about that. And we talked about that. And I'm going to reread that. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation to everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings in a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. And because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. So we had one person who separated us from God from his acts. And we had another one that restored that right relationship. One had eternal life and lost it through the fall. One came to restore eternal life for us all. And we have to understand that the rest of the Bible is what happened between then and then. It's, it's a whole story of God's redemptive plan for us. And that's what it's really all about. So let's start off in Genesis 3, 1 through 13. And it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, yeah, did God really say you must not from eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and that you must not touch it, or you will die. So the serpent said, Well, you certainly won't die. God knows if you eat from that, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And then the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. And also desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called man, where, where are you? He answered, well, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And God said to him, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the fruit of the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman put you that you put me here with, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me. Paradise lost. If we really define this down to what 
it's very clear to what happened. The fall of man, the fall of Adam, or simply the fall is the term that we use in Christianity to describe what happened. And it was the transition of Adam and Eve from a, a position or a state of innocent obedience to God to a state of guilty disobedience. So the doctrine of fall comes from that biblical interpretation of Genesis chapters 1 through 3. And we know that they had and they knew what was at stake because God told them ahead of time. And I'd have to think they had, had to have some kind of clue as to what they were doing was not right because God told them not to do it specifically. But as kids, any of us that are parents out here knows that Usually when we tell the kids something not to do specifically, that gives them incentive to go and do it. But there you have it. Sin and separation. So you may be wondering what Adam and Eve's relationship was with God before the fall. That kind of popped into my head. Well, Adam and Eve lived in unbroken communion with God. The scripture says that they walked and talked with God face to face. Notice that from there on out, from that sin, no one was able to be in God's direct presence without being overcome. So they were in a perfect relationship with God. They were innocent and trusted him. Genesis 2.25 says that the man and his wife were both naked but they felt no shame. They felt no shame. But all that changed. All that changed. Genesis 3, 13 through 19 describes the fall and its repercussions. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild, and you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And the man, to the man, he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree of fruit that I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. And to the man, he said, It will grow thorns and thistles for you. All of your life you will struggle to make a scratch living from it. Though you will eat of its grains by the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Now if we look at the words and we listen very closely to those words, did you see that Adam and Eve immediately became afraid of God when they, when they sinned? And they hid in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. And see, that shows immediately that breaking of the relationship between man and God. The intimate relationship was gone. The innocence was lost. The trust was lost. The immortality was gone. Death came. Sickness came. Pain came. Because of their disobedience, Adam and Eve also suffered spiritual death. They were in perfect communion with God. They walked and talked with him in the garden. And they could have had that throughout eternity. And all of their offspring could have had that for eternity. No death, no pain, no sickness. But sin separated them from that future. And this meant that they and their children through the generations could not walk and talk face to face with God. Adam and Eve and their descendants were separated from God both physically and spiritually. Life as they knew it at that point in time was over. 
They died a death of relationship. Just as God said it would happen. So I guess this could have been the end of the story, but really, it's only the beginning. So read the book, right? All right, let's go back to Genesis 2, 9. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Here we read about the tree of life in the center of the garden. Literally, the tree of life. Did the battery die? Oh, no. Shut it off. I think I, uh, there you go. Back online. Can you hear me anyway, Bill? Uh, so we read about the tree of life in the center of the garden, and literally it was in the center of the garden. The tree of life is called that because each one eating it would live forever. It was a tree that extended their lifetime. The tree of life is a life-giving tree created by God to support the physical and spiritual life of mankind at that point in time. When Adam and Eve sinned, God expelled them from the Garden of Eden. And it's been an inherent virtue in the tree of life to preserve life indefinitely. Indefinitely. If man was created to live forever, should he not sin, then he lost eternal life in the fall. The tree of life would have caused even sinful man to live forever physically. Hence the action in Genesis 3, 22 and 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned in every way to keep away anyone from the tree of life. It was guarded. A writer at Christianity.com offers this for us to consider. It was a mercy that God kept us from the tree of life barring access to the tree of life and in doing so God showed compassion his omniscience showing that and knowing that because sin and earthly life would be filled with sorrow and toil God graciously limited the numbers of men that they would live to live eternally in a sinful state would have meant endless agony for humanity with no hope for the relief that comes with death. By limiting our lifespan, God gives us enough time to come to know him and his provision for eternal life through Christ Jesus. But he spares us that misery of an endless existence in a sinless, sinful condition. Have you ever thought about it that way? It's amazing because it, as I was going through and I was doing my research in here, I was kind of going through this and going, I've never thought of it that way. We were spared by being cast out of the garden. So we wouldn't have to live in agony for the rest of time. For the rest of time. So here stands mankind, sinners condemned to die, toil, suffer pain, and death. Once God's favored creation who walked and talked with God face to face, now an outcast, separated from God, physically and spiritually. And again, this could be the end of the story. But see, it's not over yet. Read the book, right? So we have a, a Father in Heaven that is a loving God, full of grace and mercy and love. He allows man to venture forth and to have his free will, and not unlike a loving parent, he disciplines his children when they venture too far off course. He gives mankind a path, then, to get back into his good graces. And he prompts us along the way. Yep, we're still sinners. Yep, we're still separated from God. But, but, God sends a second Adam, born without sin, living a pure life, giving us a living example that man can live a sinless life if he chooses to do so. Jesus, the tree of life, comes to mankind. See, I found this to be a, 
a really great explanation of the redemptive power of the tree of life. Here, the tree of life is a symbol of Christ himself giving immortality. Our tree of life is Jesus Christ, granting us immortality through his defeat of death on the cross. A tree. Because of inherited sin of Adam and Eve, we now have the knowledge of good and evil and the free will to choose between the life-giving belief in Jesus or the deadly pursuit of selfish passions. Jesus resurrected our access to the tree of life by his cross and granted everlasting life to mankind once again. Mankind then can be restored back into a right relationship with God. Jesus is that tree of life. He restores us and gives us the ability to have eternal life through belief and faith in him. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And if you remember what I just got done saying in this, paragraph before, because of inherited sin of Adam and Eve, we now have that knowledge of good and evil and free will to choose between the life-giving belief in Jesus or the deadly pursuit of selfish passions. So Jesus is telling us in Matthew, here he says, if anyone would come after me, deny himself, deny those selfish passions. Take up your cross, that tree, and follow me. We have to crucify ourselves. We have to be crucified ourselves, dead to our sinly nature, our sinful nature, and be resurrected again through Christ Jesus. I am the way and the truth and the life, and anyone who wants to come to the Father comes by me. To eat of the free of the true, uh, I'm sorry, to eat of the tree of life now is to follow Christ by bearing our cross in repentance, obedience, faith, and love for God. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Revelations 2, 7. Thanks be to God. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, help us to open our eyes and to understand what you have done in our lives. Even though we sinned and we rebelled against you, even though we disobeyed you, Lord, you gave us a way back. You gave us your word to show us the path to go through. You gave us the instructions on how to live a godly life and to come back to you and to be able to walk in communion with you in paradise. You sent your own son who took on our sins and died a terrifying death on the cross to give us life, to restore a right relationship with you. Lord God, this is the day that you have made. and Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us understand fully. Open our ears to hear, our eyes to see. Lord, what you have done for us. Restore unto us that life-giving power through Christ Jesus. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. It makes the message come alive in what we do now. In that Jesus or Adam's and Eve sin, <coughs> Jesus came and took away that sin. He fulfilled the law for us.
Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. Now, Paul doesn't meet Jesus until he's on the road and he is struck blind. It's like uh, Hezekiah's, King Hezekiah's saying. Hezekiah, he lived for God his entire reign. But his son came in and did what was uh, awful in God's eyes. He sinned against the Lord. Until he is taken prisoner by the Assyrians. And he gets down on his knees and he cries out to God. Which is what we can do all the time. We have that ability. And what God does is he lifts us up from our knees. He grabs us and he gives us a big hug. And he tells us how much he loves us. That is because of what Jesus did. Paul continues, he says, um, when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Each time we come together, my wife and I, every time we have a meal, it doesn't matter if we, well, last Sunday we were at American Skillet and the four of us came together for a meal and what did we do before we broke bread together? But he's thanking God for more than just food. He's thanking God for the sacrifice that he is about to make on the cross. He said, then he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, Jesus' blood on the cross. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death. But here's the powerful part of this. Until he comes again, he will return. Right now, with you know, we think about the way the world is right now, but if we look back at history, you know, this whole thing about is Genesis history, we look back, these same things have been happening over and over again. We just aren't learning from our, from our mistakes of our uh, people that came before us. But that's the beauty of what this meal represents. It helps us to remember what Jesus did for us and how we are saved. The body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Father, we thank you for what this meal represents. We thank you for those that have gone before us that carried on these words, that taught these words to their children and their children to their children until it reached us. And Father, may it continue to go from us to our children and their children and their children's children. May your name never be forgotten. Thank you for sending son to die on the cross for his father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Well, I've been given a few prayers to pray for some people. Is there anyone else that would like to ask for prayer this morning? started. Father God, we come to you this morning with a heart of thanksgiving for all you, for you alone sustain us through all trials we face. You fill our lives with purpose, you heal our bodies, you give our hearts hope when we feel there is no hope. 
You give us grace when we least expect it and don't deserve it. We are conquerors through Jesus who loves us. Once we ask for forgiveness and repent of our sins, you will never let us go. For you alone are God, and you alone sustain us through all things. Father God, I'd like to lift up Becky. Um, she's asking for prayer for RA doctor to be able to help her with her right with the right medications so that she can move her hands, Lord Jesus. Father God, you know Becky's body. You formed her in, the, in her mother's womb. You know her through and through, throughout every day, what kind of pain she deals with, physical, mental, whatever it is. Please send her to the correct doctors that can help her with her problems, Lord Jesus, and help her to be able to move her hands and her feet, her extremities, Lord Jesus. For you are God and you can do this. And we thank you and praise you for Becky's life. Father God, I would like to lift up Don and Denny. Um, Don for vertigo and pain, Denny for dizziness. And only you, Lord, know what is causing this. Um, they each have their own different cause. But Lord, I pray that you will walk with them through this trial. Give them courage to face each day. Steady their minds and hearts. Keep them focused on you, O oh God. Cover them with the blood of Jesus. Let no weapon formed against them prosper. Bring them back to health and stabilize them in your mighty name, Jesus. And we pray for Kip Evans, who has three big tears and one small tear in his rotator cuff and will need surgery. Lord God, you have let this happen for a reason. We don't know what that is. But we are going to thank you for whatever comes of this, Lord Jesus. We thank you for Kip Evans. We thank you for his life. And we pray that you will give the doctors knowledge and wisdom on how to, how to fix this rotator cuff, Lord God. That it will be better than before. And that his other shoulder will remain solid and nothing will happen to it either, Lord Jesus. Um, he has work that he is doing that he needs to use his shoulders. I pray that you cover him with your righteousness and your blood and just keep him protected as he goes through this surgery and he heals quickly from it, Lord Jesus. For you are God and through you all things are possible. And Lord, I just pray all this for all the people online if there's any others in need of prayer. I just, I just pray that you will walk with them daily, Lord Jesus. Help them to know you are God and that you are a loving God and that you will heal them if they ask you. All they need to do is open your Bible or read your word and pray. It's so easy just to offer up a prayer of help, Lord God. Just be with them and comfort them and help them to do this so that they can be healed as well. In Romans 8, 38 and 39, it says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In Jesus' holy name, we thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for being with us online today. This closes out our online portion of our service. And uh, we have links to the music that we're going to listen to today, uh, which should speak to the message kind of clearly. And uh, we look forward to you joining us in person when you're able. Uh, and so we uh, want to go to God in prayer and close out our service today. So Holy Lord, who sent your Son to save us, I pray today that we can be reconciled to you. I pray to live in Christ and let go of my worldly desires and instead follow where Jesus leads. May I be made new in Christ to be reconciled to you, O Father, and be forgiven of my sins through your great mercy and grace. Loving Father, thank you that your word is powerful and effective, living and active. You have promised that I don't need to be anxious about anything, but in every situation, 
I should present my request humbly with an earnest heart and that you will listen and you will respond. I lift up my relationship to you before you today and I ask you to bring restoration and healing. Replace my fear with faith in you. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guide and guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you that there is nowhere I can go that is beyond your presence. Fill my relationship with the peace that comes from your presence. Your word says that my faith will never be put to shame when I put my trust in you. Give me faith in your power to restore my life. I humbly submit my life to you today. Paradise restored. Help me to trust you with all my heart. You are the sovereign King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light. To you be honor and eternal glory. Through Christ Jesus our Lord.